uh, the uh, cartoon uh, ocean biological pump hope everybody is able to see my slide yes yes we can we can see uh, sunil okay thank you thank you sir so this is the very uh, important cartoon which everybody is aware yeah. the, about the ocean biological pump in which in presence of sunlight carbon dioxide is getting converted to organic carbon uh, through, through photosynthesis uh, means uh, large phytoplankton or small phytoplankton and it is getting converted to um, zooplankton and then fisheries and part of this organic carbon is going to the deep ocean and also part of that is going to the sediments and permanently getting locked and th this entire process of productivity is controlling the co2 of the atmosphere to the very comfortable level which we are very, very much important to survive the life now if you see this important phenomena in terms of productivity of the ocean to global ocean this entire productivity in the global ocean is not uniform it is changing or it is varying significantly you can see here in equatorial in the equatorial sorry let me let me start this pointer in the equatorial ocean productivity is significantly high but if you go to the southern ocean around the antarctica the productivity is very very low so people were worried means why it is happening like that whether a nutrient is less or what exact reason is uh, there for this low productivity it was not very well known and uh, you can see here the nitrate concentration in the global ocean and exactly in those areas where productivity is very low around, around that uh, antarctica the nitrate concentration is very very high so this is uh, a very, very much uh, enigmatic situation where you have a high nutrient but uh, productivity is very low so the, anyway this area is called high nutrient low chlorophyll region and in the beginning it was not uh, people are not aware why it is happening even after the bloom season uh, nutrients are remaining to be utilized productivity is very very low and people are puzzled about that so in 90s after the iron experiment people started to think in that direction that it is happening because of lack of micronutrients such as nitrate so then it came to my in mind that micronutrients are very very important for all the ocean work they work as uh, or they 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 work or they can be utilized for many many uh, processes like uh, metalloproteins metalloenzymes if you see here trace metals play a key role uh, in many of the metabolic uh, pathways like you can see uh, in the storage and transport uh, meta metalloprotein so to carry oxygen hemoglobin is required where iron is required you can see cytochromes uh, calcium is required and so on you, similarly if you see the enzymes metalloenzymes carbonic anhydride zinc is required vitamin well uh, cobalt everybody knows it is required nitrogenase molybdenum iron magnesium is required so for even photosynthesis and all uh, you know uh, for nitrogen fixation iron is required so a lot of trace metals are required and the, the area where you have high nutrient and low chlorophyll is and it was it was uh, suggested that because of lack of this micronutrients productivity is very less so uh, people started to think to study this micronutrients in the entire ocean in addition to their this many this uh, metabolic roles of this this micronutrients these trace metals are also uh, used to study the paleo ocean processes or paleo climate because these trace metals or isotopes become part of the orthogenic uh, precipitates and uh, later on they can be utilized to study the paleo oceanographic processes similarly some of the trace metals are also toxic and they act as a pollutant so even uh, pollution study can be used through this uh, uh, trace metal study <coughs> trace metal are not only required for the productivity but they also uh, impact the ecosystem dynamics so here you can see the zinc concentration in the organic matter which was deposited uh, below before 800 million year and this curve is for the organic matter which was there after 800 million year so you can see there is a distinct difference between zinc concentration of organic organ, organics which were dwelling 800 before 800 million year and after 800 million year, million year 
and you know that zinc concentration before 800 million year in the ocean was very very low and after 800 million it has increased because of change in oxygen concentration so you can see the concentration of zinc has changed the life from uh, this uh, prokaryote to eukaryote now, i am not telling that this is the only factor which is changing the ecosystem dynamics so they are also important for changing the this ecosystem dynamics of the ocean so in one way you can see that trace metals are very much important for productivity but also the productivity there in the ocean they are also impacting the distribution of this trace metal so to start to to study this uh, trace metals this is very much required to know their sources sinks and internal cycling what is happening in the uh, water column what is happening is what is happening at the uh, the uh, interface of atmosphere and uh, wa water so all this study there is a requirement to study means to understand the whole trace metal behavior sources sinks and internal cycling so you can if you see this trace metals uh, the sources they are supplied by a continental runoff uh, riverine supply is very very significant but they are getting modified in the estuary we have atmospheric deposition then we have hydrothermal activities which are contributing to this uh, hydrothermal this uh, trace metals to the or micronutrients to the ocean or also the continental self interaction uh, which is supplying or removing lot of trace metals they are modifying the uh, trace metal concentration micronutrient concentration in but in the beginning it was very very less information about this trace metal so there was a pro program was started to study the in this micronutrients in the entire global ocean and in indian ocean we have taken the lead so why indian ocean is important that you, you, you are very much aware that indian ocean is very unique in the sense that it is not pole to pole it has an uh, land boundary in the uh, low latitude area in northern side and also it receives huge amount of fresh water and sediment from the Him himalaya through ganga brahmaputra iravadi and indus rivers and they are really modifying the biogeochemistry of the indian ocean or particularly the Nord northern indian ocean also huge amount of dust is getting supplied from the arid land masses to the bay of bengal or arabian sea and they are impacting the biogeochemistry in addition to that we have the ocean circulation uh, deep ocean circulation which is coming from the north atlantic Uh, or our uh, antarctic bottom water they are impacting the biogeochemistry of the indian ocean and the surface water the indonesian through flow also imp impacts the the uh, micronutrient distribution in the entire indian ocean so to understand the entire process to study the uh, source edge to study the internal cycling uh, we have started a work a big work in the indian ocean and which was really started in 2012 but uh, the work uh, really started i think uh, about 7 8 6, 6 to 7 years before and it was funded by ministry of earth sciences in which ninth institution of india participated in this program so as you are aware the this work is very very challenging in the terms that measurement and uh, sampling is not easy because of low concentration uh, uh, this um, contamination is really a really a big problem so we uh, established all the systematics uh, for sampling and also the measurement techniques and we started to sample the ocean in 2013 uh, up to ocean, open ocean coastal ocean estuary pore water aerosol samples everything was collected to understand the all the sources sinks and the internal cycling so till now if you see the we have measured all the key parameters like iron magnesium zinc aluminum cadmium cobalt nickel copper lead uranium thorium rare earths uh, these elements uh, in which some of them are directly related to the uh, the biology which are contributing to the productivity very much required as a micronutrient some of them are Uh, acting as a uh, pollutant sources like uh, lead and even some of them are acting as a proxies uh, so we are like rare earth element and then we have also measured lot of isotopes like neodymium hafnium to track the water masses and also the sediment water interaction we have uh, studied the molybdenum isotope silicon isotope to see whether we can use uh, to understand the impact of productivity thorium to understand the behavior of particle water interaction and all those things so these things are already studied and partly will be showing you so these are some of the establishments which we have done clean sampling system measurement uh, sampling and the measurement techniques so in the beginning you were using flow injection system on board seaboard to on board uh, sagar kanya to measure the iron uh, magnesium aluminum and zinc 
Later on, we have shifted to see past HR ICPMS on, on board uh, uh, in uh, offshore laboratory, and we are continuously now measuring all the uh, elemental composition dissolve uh, and in the pore waters and uh, sea water, all the uh, uh, means uh, trace metal composition in the sea water. So here, by now, we have already samples. Uh, I think. Uh, most of the Indian Ocean, if not all, uh, and uh, it, it, you can see here the sampling has been done very densely. Our uh, the resolution is very very high, and you can see by uh, in eight cruises we have sampled most of the uh, Indian Ocean from North Indian Ocean to up to 30 degrees south, and we have tried to go to the Eastern Indian Ocean also and up to Western uh, Arabian Sea. So most of the Indian Ocean is covered till now, and we have. Uh, now started measurement. So, so if you see some of the results uh, uh, which uh, we have produced, uh, so this is the very much uh, iron. You can see here iron has been measured uh, in all the Indian Ocean samples and you can see the sources. If you're talking about iron sources, so a lot of iron is coming from the silf region. Actually, the, in the beginning, uh, people were uh, concentrating mostly on uh, atmospheric deposition. So here you can see the silf is very, very important. And also uh, iron is getting remineralized in the oxygen minimum zone. Uh, but what is surprising here is that we have got uh, many other sources of iron, which is hydrothermal uh, sources, like here in the, you can see this uh, um, uh, uh, ridge like so Central Indian ridge and Southwest Indian ridge and, and uh, many other ridges, I think we are getting a lot of uh, iron, uh, dissolved iron. And actually some of the iron which is coming from the hydrothermal area, they are coming up to the, up to the surface. So the, the belief that uh, iron, which is coming from hydrothermal areas, are getting uh, deposited uh, just around the uh, hydrothermal ridges, I think that is not true. They are coming to the surface and they are contributing to the productivity. Very surprising result we have got in this uh, subduction area. And the subduction area, I think iron is the uh, first time you have reported. So what is happening? You can see in the next slide, actually. So this is the subduction area along the Burma Sumatra uh, region where uh, uh, the, I think seawater is subducting along with the Indian plate and there it is interacting with the interior of the mantle material and to the seawater and they are supplying a lot of iron actually. So this is first time uh, subduction has been identified as a source uh, in other, other than the hydrothermal uh, uh, source. So you can see here uh, this uh, iron concentration in the Arabian Sea. Uh, we have seen the photic zone integrated iron is changing with uh, season actually. So the uh, iron uh, concentration in fall monsoon season is much more higher compared to the spring uh, inter monsoon. And also there is a special variability, the Eastern Arabian Sea having much higher iron com compared to the Central and uh, Western Arabian Sea. And this iron, whatever we are having, is having very much good correlation with uh, this primary productivity. And it shows that high availability of iron is responsible for high primary productivity than Arabian Sea compared to the subtropical Indian Ocean. So we try to make the budget in the top 100 meter of the Arabian Sea. And you can see here the earlier belief that most of the iron is coming from dust, even though the Arabian Sea is very much prone to the dust uh, uh, deposition. But the dust contribution of iron is uh, not the primary source. It is not negligible, but the main iron to the Arabian Sea is either coming from horizontal advection from both the coast, eastern and western coast, uh, like uh, uh, the western uh, coast of uh, uh, India, or, or it is coming from Oman region. So you can see here the constant, uh, the iron flux, which is coming in 0.4 micromole per meter square per day. And similarly, iron coming from the Indian coast is 0.3 micromole per meter square per day. Whereas if you see the vertical advection because of filling in the open ocean, it is iron which is coming is 0.1 to 0.4 micromole, micromole per meter square per day. Whereas the atmospheric dust is only 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 uh, uh, micromole per meter square per day as dry deposition and 0 0.0 to 0 0.03 micromole per meter square per day for uh, wet deposition. So if you see the lateral and vertical advection flushes are important source of iron to the photic zone with atmospheric iron dust uh, uh, is playing only secondary role. And both biotic and abiotic processes are a significant sink of iron. So based on this budget, you can see that the residence time of iron in the top 100 meter is only 0.1 to 1 year in this photic zone. So this is this is very important result which shows that important source of iron, is, at least in Arabian Sea, is not the dust. And if you talk about the iron limitation, so iron limitation, uh, both Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, significant portion of the 
this uh, oceans are uh, iron limited so what is happening actually the southern source water the antarctic intermediate water which is bringing the low iron uh, to the this northern indian oceans they are getting upwelled in the equatorial region and southern part of the bay of bengal and arabian sea so they are the main important uh, source of water which is bringing low iron so that is true in the bay of bengal and arabian sea also you can see here the, this this profile uh, in the central uh, uh, section if you see uh, uh, low iron uh, intermediate water is coming and getting up filled here and similarly this portion also low iron is coming so intermediate water southern source intermediate water which is having low iron it is uh, giving iron limitation in the arabian sea and also if you see near the persian gulf actually the deeper water is almost iron deficient so filling up that uh, deeper water is also responsible for the iron limitation in the western arabian sea so these are the two factors which is having very much important uh, uh, factor which is acting as a iron limitation in the arabian sea now coming to the zinc so all these areas we have analyzed zinc and actually we have a poster for this uh, by chini at all you can go and, uh, to see the detail work on that so zinc is uh, concentration is uh, significantly higher compared to iron and it is also behaving very much like uh, uh, nutrients there is no doubt about that but the very important factor is that here also you can see this zinc, zinc profile and in, around the hydrothermal area uh, which is uh, we try to calculate the zinc which is not supported by the sinking particles and in this area a lot of zinc is there which is coming from the hydrothermal area so zinc is also supplied by the uh, hydrothermal area at least in the indian ocean many of the many part i think they are not important but here it is showing that in the in this uh, triple junction area the zinc is coming from the hydrothermal area and actually if you come to the Uh, bay of bengal uh, near the visakhapatnam area we are getting high concentration of uh, this uh, uh, zinc and i think after a uh, lot of analysis we have found that this is happening because this area is dominated by uh, siliceous productivity diatom productivity and di since the diatom requires a lot of zinc so they are getting dissolved and supplying so the lot of zinc so the dissolution of zinc, uh, this di siliceous productivity or siliceous material diatom are producing a significant amount of uh, zinc to the inter water column of the uh, bay of bengal particularly in the coastal region so here this this effect is much more clear you can see here so zinc has been uh, plotted with uh, phosphate and always in the global river uh, global ocean it has been it, is, it gives two slopes for the surface and the deeper water so he, it is uh, true for the indian ocean also but important thing here i want to show you if you see this uh, and uh, intermediate water uh, slope uh, which zinc versus phosphate ratio in this area in the particular in the bay of bengal is 4.34 which is significantly higher compared to the bay of bengal, uh, arabian sea which is 2.8 Uh, and in uh, subtropical indian ocean it is 3 and whereas andaman sea is again very similar to the bay of bengal 4.5 so uh, this significant uh, higher zinc with respect to phosphate in the bay of bengal again is as i told you it is related to the uh, siliceous productivity because bay of bengal is known for this it is called actually siliceous ocean because uh, uh, siliceous productivity is more so when siliceous productivity is more and uh, this diatom requires more uh, zinc so when they are sinking they are they are uh, remineralization re remineralization is producing more uh, uh, zinc so here i just was telling you though the this stress metals are contr contr controlling the productivity or the ecosystem but here the ecosystem is controlling the distribution of zinc so or stress metals so because of siliceous productivity here in the bay of bengal zinc is more with respect to phosphate whereas in the arabian sea it is less because of it is having more calcareous productivity so based on this uh, type of productivity zinc uh, concentration is getting determined now here you see the uh, plot of zinc versus silicate so you can see the in the global ocean zinc is very much related to silicate and uh, sort of uh, and global ocean this ratio zinc by silica is 0.06 which is very much similar we are getting in the subtropical indian ocean also but if you see in the arabian sea and bay of bengal this slope is very less 0.05 and 0.048 even statistically they are very low compared to the global ocean and if you see the only the oxygen minimum zone this uh, slope is 0.033 and 0.036 in bay of bengal and arabian sea and even in the andaman sea 
So it was very surprising why this is happening, and it has been explained in terms of uh, loss of zinc uh, either in uh, uh, because of sulfide precipitation. What is happening in the oxygen minimum zone in micro uh, uh, volume, very small volume in the micro level, uh, sulfide hydrogen sulfide is getting produced, and because of that, zinc is getting converted to zinc sulfide, and which is very much refractory. So the zinc sulfide grains are getting. Uh, formed and which is again even after the zinc uh, sulfide is not there hydrogen sulfide is not there even they are interacting with oxygen they they are uh, because they are refractive they are not dissolving and they will uh, go to the um, uh, they will sink and deposit in the sediment so they means in fact the oxygen minimum zone area zinc is getting lost in form of sulfide so this is one of the mechanism but still people have not found this zinc sulfide grains in the this um, uh, sediment so you need to look into that the sinking particles uh, and also there is one possibility that in oxygen minimum zone uh, we are producing uh, <coughs> And the, nowadays, you can see that prokaryote concentration is increasing. So, if prokaryote is more, zinc requirement for them is less. So, if they are remineralizing, then uh, zinc can be lower, lowered in the oxygen minimum zone. So, these both possibilities are there. So, we need to look into more detail which one is dominant, why the zinc is getting lost. And similarly, if you see the zinc budget in the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, actually, so atmospheric deposition is 0 0.09, whereas here also it is very much important, the horizontal advection and vertical uh, advection is important, both uh, term is very much important, which is getting counterbalanced by abiotic and both biotic removal. But in the Bay of Bengal, zinc uh, horizontal supply is significantly lower compared to the uh, 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 Arabian Sea. So this budget has been done in, with respect to that. Cadmium is also measured or cadmium? So ca cadmium was also measured and I think there was some recording in there. So I'm sorry for that. So cadmium is also showing very much similar to the zinc. Uh, and it is also getting lost. Part of the cadmium is getting lost in the oxygen minimum uh, zone. Uh, I think and there also it's, it has been shown that in the oxygen minimum zone, the cadmium uh, sulfide is forming and because of that it is getting lost. So next is manganese. So manganese uh, is uh, very much interesting here. So you can see this manganese in the Arabian Sea. So in the sur surface it is high uh, as uh, in other ocean. But you can see here in the uh, this uh, near this this particular uh, in oxygen minimum zone and near the coastal area, it is uh, zinc is significantly higher. So it is uh, either it is getting uh, uh, coming from the uh, remineralization uh, or uh, the dissolution of uh, iron magnesium hydroxide in the oxygen minimum zone and also some self supply is also happening and in the in the other part actually you can see it is also controlled by salinity so bay of bengal low salinity water is coming and providing higher manganese concentration but the uh, the work if you see in the indian ocean bay of bengal and indian ocean there is a poster by malla et al we should see that Actually, very interesting result. You can see the coastal or northern Indian Ocean, particularly the Ganga Brahmaputra mouth self region, manganese concentration is significantly higher. Similarly, in the in the Andaman Sea, also it is very very high. And you can see, though they are getting uh, controlled by the uh, river water supply with low salinity water, but the significant control is there again. Oxygen minimum zone, the self supply in the self. Because the oxygen is getting reduced, iron magnesium hydroxide is getting uh, dissolved, and manganese is getting supplied. Similarly, if you go to the hydrothermal area, uh, in further in the Indian Ocean, open Indian Ocean, we are getting manganese higher concentration in those areas where hydrothermal areas are there, and subduction areas, as I told you, in the iron, they are also supplying a lot of manganese. And uh, the benthic sources, we have done the pore manganese in pore water, and you can see here the significantly means order of magnitude higher the means uh, tenth of, uh, it is almost uh, nanomole to becoming micromole in the pore water and this pore water is a very significant source of uh, uh, manganese to the uh, bottom uh, uh, sea water in the indian ocean coming to the aluminum uh, there will be talk by uh, 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 Namandeep Singh on the aluminum, uh, both in, for the entire Indian Ocean. So here uh, we have tried to uh, see the fluxes of dust and all from uh, major. Uh, we have measured using aluminum concentration in the Indian Ocean. So we can easily see the impact of Ganga Brahmaputra, particularly in the Bay of Bengal, high, supplying the high concentration of. Uh, uh, aluminum and also some of the areas where you have the hydrothermal area in this area, uh, gym, uh, aluminum is getting controlled by interaction of that. So uh, 
though the means dust variability and all is easily captured by aluminum concentration so we we aluminum has been used to study the dust and input from the dust also and the then i think uh, just i'm approaching uh, the end of my talk so this is this is uh, some of the example i'm showing you for the pollution the lead ice, lead can be utilized as a element which is coming from the pollution so you can see here lead concentration in the indian ocean has been measured again in bay of bengal arabian sea and in the entire indian ocean so if you see the bay of bengal uh, particularly in, in the uh, bay of bengal our lead concentration is significantly high it is going up to 125 picomolar whereas if you go to the open ocean it is almost 25 or something like that so it is much lower uh, in the open ocean so in the coastal area because of you know coal burning and all we are having higher concentration of uh, this uh, lead uh, but significantly has gone down similarly if you see the coastal area of uh, arabian sea again the lead concentration is coming from the anthropogenic sources in the riverine sources or whatever it is so they are still Uh, getting controlled by the pollution sources, but if you compare with the Atlantic, the, still the Indian Ocean lead concentration is significantly higher. Here you can see the Atlantic section, uh, beautiful section. You can see the surface is almost gone to 20, and this is the the uh, lead which has been supplied uh, earlier, which has sink, sunk, sunken now. But today, if you see the concentration is significantly low, but in India you can see the Indian Ocean is still 50 to 100 uh, picomolar, much higher than the Atlantic. And I think it is mostly coming from the uh, coal burning and all those things, uh, which is uh, contributing significantly to the lead. Similarly, copper, copper again uh, coming in the coastal area, you can see of uh, India, uh, this uh, Indian Ocean, uh, this is uh, Arabian Sea as well as the Bay of Bengal. coastal ocean again it is a significant uh, copper is coming and this is again uh, impact uh, getting affected by the anthropogenic sources and uh, last actually you have used lot of indium isotope composition to measure the uh, or to attract the water masses and you can see here in the india uh, bay of bengal actually lot of indium uh, concentration is very uh, uh, high and also the isotopic composition is very non radiogenic which is giving signature of uh, himalayan signature so so the sediment which is there in the uh, bay of bengal coming from himalaya they are releasing lot of uh, uh, neodymium either through dissolution or through benthic fluxage and they are uh, changing the entire water column and uh, most of the water uh, sediment which is coming uh, they are supplying a huge neodymium and impacting the dissolved component but the water masses which is uh, defined here is indonesian through flow and uh, north antarctic deep water and bottom water they have been identified based on the neodymium isotopic composition and here you can see the arabian sea neodymium isotopic composition in the becoming if you go to the northern arabian sea is vertical so it is mostly i think impact of a filling of the deep water which is uh, happening here so this is very beautifully getting tracked and here in the last section you can see the indonesian through flow which is coming from uh, pacific to the indian ocean it is getting tra- very much tracked by the neodymium isotopic composition and uh, this is the rare earth which uh, again has been used to track the different water masses so uh, i think uh, my time is over so i will stop it here and uh, the final slide here you can see that uh, this uh, the uh, submarine groundwater discharge is also one of the important source for the coastal area for many of the test metals so we our study has shown that the if you see the arabian uh, bay of bengal uh, particularly the eastern eastern indian coast uh, the, uh, almost 25% of the water uh, is, uh, is coming from submarine submarine groundwater discharge which is almost 25% of the riverine flux but in terms of uh, dissolved flux chemical fluxes they are equivalent so here i have taken example of strontium so strontium supplied by the submarine groundwater water discharge to the bay of bengal is very much equivalent to the supplied by the river so the submarine groundwater discharge is also a very important uh, source of uh, trace metals or micronutrients to the uh, indian ocean so thank you very much i will stop it here thank you very much sunil um can every can you hear me okay Yes, yes. Yes. Well, as the GeoTraces program has just been amazing, it's revolutionizing our understanding of these trace metals all over the world and also in the Indian Ocean. These are such impressive data. Um I will go ahead in the interest of preserving time uh for our panel discussion later. I'm going to hold questions, but I do encourage folks to please 
uh, uh, post your questions for Sunil in the chat. I see there's already some questions in there for Sunil, and I'm sure he can he will take the time to answer those questions. So let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Greg Cowie. The title of his talk is "What Control Sedimentary Carbon Content Insights from the Contrasting Margins of the Arabian Sea." Greg. Thank you. Um, I, I hope I'm not mute. I hope I'm any, everyone hearing me. Yes, you're good. Loud and clear. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to try to share this, um, sc my screen, and uh, one second, I will start from the beginning and get my pointer. So is that, is everything visible to everyone? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, um, Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, depending on where you are. Um, I'm, I feel really privileged to be able to present today, and thank the, the thank everyone for the for the invitation. Um, and I, what I'm going to talk about is basically the tail end of that biological pump that Sue mentioned. Um, it's the carb is carbon burial in marine sediments and what controls it and. It's something that's been looked at um, for decades now, and in the Indian Ocean ever since um, Sir John Murray um, of the Challenger Expedition led the first oceanographic expedition in the Indian Ocean um, in the 1930s with the Mabahis uh, um, Expedition, an Egyptian vessel. And basically my talk is going to be about um, this feature um, over here, which is this sort of bathtub ring of organic rich sediments that lines the margins or most of the margins. Murray expedition between um, oxygen poor waters and the and organic rich sediments, which were what attributed to be or, or found suggested to be a causal link. And my talk is going to be about studies from different margins of the Arabian Sea, with an, which what I hope will convince you that you can get very different, um, draw de de very different conclusions based on d data from different margins. And I'm going to present some new results. This is stuff I've been doing for 20 odd years or 30 odd years, I should say. But I'm going to present some new results that I think then that can pull together um, into um, the, the, the apparently contrasting results into a, um, a, a, a one single explanation conceivably. So I'm going to at least speculatively come to that conclusion. So I'm going to be talking about sediments from the Oman margin, the um, Pakistan margin, and the Indian margins. And these are things that have, sediments that have been collected since the early, in the, early, in the mid 80s in the case of Oman through to um, the, the 90s and the two, early 2000s off of Pakistan. So up here, this has been a, a number of different cruises that I've been involved with. And then more recently, stuff from the Indian margin, 2008, that involves um, a manned submersible dives. And more recently, a study that on the Indian shelf and slope that um, I worked on with um, uh, Waji Nakvi and his group. Um, and so, what I'm going to sh show is that these three margins actually represent um, show show quite different features that from which you could draw quite different conclusions. So, two of the big um, hitters in terms of controls on sedimentary carbon co content and distributions are obviously the input term, which is productivity um, driven, and clearly, if you look at this. Um, ocean color image, it's clear that the margins are quite different with respect to productivity um, in magnitude, but also in their in the aerial extent offshore. So off of, on the on the in the Western Arabian Sea off Oman, clearly you have very intense productivity during the summer monsoons, but also it's spread much further offshore, whereas the low levels are overall lower and much more concentrated close to shore in the um, the, the, the eastern and northeastern Arabian Sea. So, arguably, you could look at the relative um, um, in, in influences of productivity in as sort of this um, clockwise um, rotation from relatively low values off Pakistan, mid medium values off India, and highest uh, spatially and um, in, in terms of intensity off Oman. 
The other obvious um, factor then would be not just input, but then preservation and conceivably then this link to oxygen depletion. And that too shows um, cross basin differences. So you have a, an oxygen minimum zone that extends across the basin and it's pretty much um, focused around a, a core depth of around 300 meters. And this shows the distribution of oxygen across the Arabian Sea at a depth of 300 meters. And you can see that there's a clear gradient from relatively limited oxygen depletion off the to the southwest to intensifying um, um, depletion to the northwest. So in that sense, you could argue that you've got relatively well ventilated, less oxygen depleted waters off Oman um, and intensifying towards Pakistan in a counterclockwise direction. So we've got very different um, 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 features on these three different margins. And Basically, what I'm going to show here is that you also get very different features in terms of carbon distributions. So taking pack, so this is your typical oxygen plot for the entire Arabian Sea, although the, the, the minima that are reached will vary. They, it varies between about 200 and about 12 to 1300 meters, depending on where you set your limits. And the, the actual minimum values are typically found between 300 and 400 meters. And then you get a shoaling of the upper boundary onto the continental shelf. Um, so that it, whereas it's typically at about 200 meters, it can rise to less than 100 meters in some shelf areas. Off Pakistan, what you see is a very nice plot with this quite close um, inverse relationship between oxygen and carbon. Um, so you could um, immediate. So we've got these maxima in the in the oxygen minimum zone, which I've decide, defined here in approximate terms with this pale blue shading. And you can see that you've got higher values in the oxygen minimum zone and lower values below and above. And at first, at face value, that would be very much then um, a, a, an indication that oxygen depletion is a, an important factor. And that um, as oxygen rises above and below the oxygen minimum zone, you get less carbon buried or preserved it, it is one way of interpreting that. Even there, however, there's um, some um, apparent anomaly in the sense that you, the carbon maxima actually is re maximum is actually reached towards the base of the oxygen minimum zone, where actually oxygen levels are higher, so than at the core. So it's not an obvious uh, um, um, link. And and then the second thing to note here is that India and Oman um, show higher carbon ma maxima within the oxygen minimum zone. And that you could attribute to higher overall productivity. But another key point here, and again, you see lower values above and below the oxygen minimum zone. But here, the other point to make is that you can get extremely variable carbon contents within the oxygen minimum zone, although oxygen concentrations are relatively invariant. And a second point is that you can get high carbon contents in sediments well below the oxygen minimum zone in fully oxygenated waters um, off Oman. So you can get organic rich sediments even where oxygen um, concentrations are low. And if you refer back to my previous slide, this could well be linked to this greater offshore extent of the higher productivity of Oman. So the take home from this is that productivity and oxygen both contribute to carbon distributions, but neither can explain everything. We certainly cannot explain this ver great variability in carbon contents within the oxygen minimum zone through just oxygen depletion, given that oxygen is relatively invariant. So another question is, well, can we actually distinguish whether preservation associated with varying um, oxygen availability is a factor in what we see in organic matter content? Can we tell that from organic matter composition? And this is a parameter now called the amino acid degradation index, and it's and and use and it's provides a means of a tested means for actually distinguishing relatively fresh or unaltered material from relatively degraded and more positive values of this degradation index are then um, more associated with fresher organic material and more negative values with more degraded. And so we've got the same data from the, the same determinations from all of these margins. 
And the first thing that you can see is that you get on the three margins now within the oxygen minimum zones, you get pretty similar values. They're around 0 to 0 0.5. And these values are higher than values that you find below the oxygen minimum. So there's a sharp decline, especially off Pakistan and India in these values, clearly indicating that the lower carbon contents at, at these depths are associated with poorer preservation of the organic matter at higher oxygen concentrations. Notably, however, off Oman, while there is a decline, it is much less sharp. So the high carbon concentrations below the oxygen minimum zone off Oman are associated with actually better preserved organic matter despite the high oxygen levels. So there's clearly something anomalous about Oman in that sense as well. So we've got this, we've got some similarities indicating that both oxygen and uh, and, 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 and productivity are important factors, but there are still things that don't make immediate sense. So one way of resolving this is that rather than thinking at only about carbon content or oxygen concentrations is actually to look at carbon burial efficiency. In other words, the percentage of carbon that is that reaches the sediments that is actually buried. Um, and then also, instead of looking at oxygen concentration, to look at oxygen exposure time. And this is for this concept was first published by Hartnett et al. in 1998 in a, a, a synthesis of studies from the Mexican and Washington margins in the, um, the, the, the Eastern Pacific, which also show mid midwater oxygen minimum zones. And they showed this nice relationship now between organic carbon burial efficiency and now on a, on a log linear plot, then looking at the um, oxygen exposure time in years on the X axis. And here they showed then that if you did a log, a linear plot, excuse me, you see that you've got this, these highly variable um, carbon burial efficiencies at low oxygen exposure times. At, at, but at some apparent threshold, you see this decline at, as oxygen exposure time increases. And so this is when you when you magnify that, then you see again this great variability at low oxygen exposure time, but ultimately then this per, um, persistent decline in carbon burial efficiency as oxygen exposure time increases. And another thing to note from their findings, and this is from Kyle et al, unpublished data, is that that same degradation index, the amino acid degradation index on both these margins, shows this consistent trend as oxygen exposure increases off the, on the, uh, 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 across these margins, you see this steady decline in um, the degradation index, clearly showing this um, pre oxygen preservation effect. So, um, when we actually then look at, and this is some of the new data we've got from C14 dating of sediments from the Pakistan margin, um, which is the only, it's the first published published data of this kind in the Arabian, in Arabian Sea, we see that the Arabian Sea, or at least the Pakistan margin, follows these that the, 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 the trends seen previously off Washington and Mexico, which is that this decline in burial efficiency with increasing oxygen exposure time um, and this gradual decline in de degradation index as you go from the, the core of the oxygen minimum zone to below the oxygen minimum zone. One thing to note, however, is that the Pakistan margin values within the oxygen minimum zone appear to, appear to be somewhat higher. And, the, and although their, their degradation indices are not significantly different, it would suggest that these higher carbon burial efficiencies may well be to do with suppressed um, in situ aerobic and anaerobic respiration rates on this margin relative to others, and which is part of the whole conundrum of the Arabian Sea as to, for instance, why there is so little sulfate reduction that found in Arabian Sea sediments compared to other um, similar margins. So the conclusion from this is that it's oxygen exposure time and low oxygen exposure time that leads to the, the organic carbon enrichment within the oxygen minimum zone. Um, 
but despite this, you can see very highly variable carbon contents within the oxygen minimum zone. And the question then that I'm going to try to address here is why that variability occurs. And the one parameter that we found that possibly does explain that variability is the, our, our hydrodynamic or textural effects. And, and what I'm plotting here then are for the three margins, then the median grain size for these surface sediments. And you can see that, that, that whereas Pakistan shows very uniformly low and um, 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 grain si median, median grain size, Indian and Oman margin sediments where the, we see this very high carbon ver content variability show dramatic um, differences in grain size at, at similar depths. And so when you when we, we try to deconvolve what this story is about, we actually when plot the organic carbon content against the silt, the percent silt of the sediment, an interesting finding um, falls out. And that is that on all three margins, the sediments from within the oxygen minimum zone show a very strong relationship between organic carbon content and silt. And it's only from sites below or above the oxygen minimum zone, in other words, oxygenated sediments with longer oxygen exposure times, where that relationship falls apart and the carbon content to silt ratio drops. And so in, on all three of these, it's sites below the oxygen minimum zone or above in the case of India, where that those exceptions occur. So the take home is that carbon content is strongly correlated to silt distribution, uh, but loadings drop in oxygenated waters below and above the oxygen minimum zone. And this points to hydrodynamic regime, differences in bottom water current strength being a key factor in determining carbon content within the oxygen minimum zone. And so while oxygen depletion may be responsible or low oxygen exposure time may be responsible for organic enrichment within the oxygen minimum zone, you can the overriding control would appear to be then the hydrodynamic regime. You can still get low carbon content at in within the oxygen minimum zone in where you have strong enough currents and therefore remove fine sediment and that is illustrated here for the indian margin sites from below the oxygen minimum zone it was through um, multivariate and uh, sorry multiple regression analysis showed that the vast majority of the variance in the carbon content could be explained by oxygen below the oxygen minimum zone, but within the oxygen minimum zone, it became percent silt or hydrodynamics that are the key factor. So the question then, well, the, and a remaining fact, potential factor that I want to suggest is that benthic fauna, and this was a topic of a, a, a poster that I presented yesterday, um, that benthic fauna may be also be very important in that um, causing variability in carbon content within marine sediments, possibly related to grain size. So this is, and illustrating this is that, um, first of all, this is, this, this is the distribution of fauna that found across the Pakistan margin. And you can see that at the core of the oxygen minimum zone in the Oman of Pakistan, basically macrofauna, burrowing, bioturbating macrofauna are totally absent. You have laminated, varved sediments where bioturbation and macrofauna are, are in, in, irrelevant. Whereas off of both um, India and Oman, which are better ventilated, you see even at the core of the oxygen minimum zone, as indicated by these red boxes, you still see persisting macrofauna. So you do see macrofauna. Um, and so these are major differences between the margins in terms of the abundance and the nature of the communities of the of benthic fauna. And these may be contributing to the differences in carbon contents between sites, especially given that muddy fine sediment um, deposits have different faunal communities from those that are sandier and co or coarser or more permeable. So these 
This, these findings are also supported by tracer incubation studies, for, an, for instance, where it, it's been illustrated that there are very big differences in the um, ex extent and nature of organic matter turnover in marine sediments. So I'm getting towards the end here and some more refinements that have come from um, looking at what the nature of this or organic rich stuff in the sediments is. And this is from density fractionation. In other words, what is this stuff that travels with silt around the oxygen minimum zone? And we, we used cesium chlor chloride, which is a high density um, fluid, to actually float out discrete organic matter. And what we found was that this stuff occurs, when you look at it under an electron microscope, as very organic rich flocks up to 32% organic carbon. And that, and a maximum proportion of this is found within the oxygen minimum zone. And this is true for all three margins. And it can represent up to 33% of the total organic carbon conservatively um, in, in, uh, in these OMZ sediments. And that stuff, when you look at the degradation index now, this is the values the, the, for the light fraction, the yellow, compared to the bulk sediment. They're systematically fresher. In other words, this is preservation of intact organic material that is diagenetically fresh at um, low organic or, or low oxygen exposure time. And it's where this fresh intact debris gets deposited that largely determines the organic content of the sediments. So it looks like it's this intact organic debris and its varying distribution that can explain this variable carbon content. And this is a final um, 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 piece of the picture. This is looking at pollen now, and pollen are very much a, an example of discrete organic debris. And it builds on stuff that Rick Kyle published in 1994, again from the Washington margin. And they showed that across the Washington margin, you saw that they saw that organic carbon content and pollen counts showed very, very strong relationships all across the margin from a depth from zero to 3,000 meters. Pollen tracked carbon. And they also found that the ratio of pollen to silt was very constant down to a depth of around two and a half thousand meters. In other words, pollen was tracking silt, which is what we are finding is that discrete organic matter is tracking silt and then it plummeted. And the, so the ratio of pollen to silt sank from about a depth of 2,500 meters down to close to zero at 3,000. And this drop closely tracked a sharp rise in oxygen exposure time. So to, a, to a, an oxygen exposure of a thousand at this depth, which is somewhere up here. So in other words, this drop in the pollen to silt ratio was tracked by a sharp rise in oxygen exposure time. And when we look at the Pakistan margin, we see very similar features. The carbon to and pollen are strongly related on all three transects off the Pakistan margin. What is different is that the pollen to silt ratio actually goes up within the oxygen minimum zone with that rather than being um, constant from zero out to two and a half, two and a half thousand meters. And that's not clear why, but it may well be because the oxygen minimum zone is much more intense off, off, um, um, the, uh, off Pakistan than it is off um, um, Washington. But again, what you see is that there's this sharp decline in the pollen to silt ratio, which is the same depth range over which I previously showed the, de the, the sharp increase in ex oxygen exposure time. So the take home from this is that it further confirms, confirms that carbon variability within oxygen minimum zones can be explained by hydrodynamic distribution of discrete organic material with silt which is then overcome by longer oxygen exposure times below the oxygen minimum zone, which then becomes the key determining factor in how, how carbon gets distributed. And so with this, this is my sort of summary. Um, what, the, what the manned submersible cruises off India allowed us to do was actually to observe these um, differences between sites. And these are just snapshots of sediments, um, surface sediments from 
depths within the Indian margin, oxygen minimum zone, to well, actually to depths below it. But you can see that at similar depths within the oxygen minimum zone, you can go, which have essentially indistinguishable oxygen levels, you can get undisturbed sediments with this nice fluff layer to rippled sediments that are um, clearly more um, um, sandy, um, coarser, low silt content, and none of this discrete fluff that sits on the surface. So my overall view is that, that productivity forms a broad regional control on Arabian Sea sedimentary organic carbon distributions, which is why you can get organic rich sediments far off the continental shelf and slope off Oman. But in general, that reduced oxygen exposure time leads to organic matters, OMZ organic carbon enrichment, where it occurs, and that variable hydrodynamic regimes and bent, possibly benthic faunal assemblages are overriding controls on carbon distribution within the oxygen minimum zone, and that enrichments are in part due to accumulation and preservation of discrete organic material. In other words, this fluff that is illustrated here. And I'll close there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> you can't no, but you can't anybody applaud. I guess um, that was a really nice presentation and a, a really nice example of a long-term comparative study. Uh, the value of comparative studies that leads to a conceptual model uh, for explaining. Uh, organic carbon pres preservation in sediments. And so that's a beautiful story. And uh, thank you for that. I enjoyed it very much. And I'm sure the audience did too. Um, I'm gonna, uh, again, in, in the interest of, we're running a little over time, in the interest of preserving some time for panel discussion, I, uh, I'm gonna at, encourage folks to uh, uh, post their comments in, in the chat. Uh, I can see there are already multiple questions for you, Greg, in the chat. And so please, uh, if you have time, if you can spare a little of attention, take some time to answer those questions. Thank you, Sunil, for answering questions as well. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, uh, the third uh, presentation on our series by uh, Mar Benavides, probably ruining your last name, Mar, I'm sorry, uh, on the role of non cyanobacterial diacetros as a source of nitrogen for the Southern Indian Ocean. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm going to try to share my presentation. Um. Do you see my presentation? I see it, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay. Let me do that. All right. There we go. Got it. Okay. Okay, so I'll get started. So, yeah, I would like uh, first to thank the, the committee for inviting me to give this talk because my my history or previous experience in working on the Indian Ocean is just, is quite recent. Uh, we just got a, a, a project about a couple of years ago. Um, and we have a student involved in this, so um, so I'm, I'm not quite an expert. So I'm learning a lot from this uh, from this conference, and I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share some very preliminary data. So so this is the outline. What are we we're talking about? Uh, I guess that some people are not so familiar with nitrogen fixation in general. So I'm gonna introduce a little bit uh, what nitrogen fixation is and what it means to marine biology geochemistry. Uh, I think there's some background noise if there's some mic open somewhere. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, then I would follow um, by explaining um, nitrogen fixation in some unexpected places, how our view of nitrogen fixation in the ocean has changed uh, in the recent years. Uh, also, how it has changed with respect to the, the, the diversity, so which actual microbes are capable of being uh, fixing nitrogen. And then I will uh, present this preliminary data that we have from the Southern Indian Ocean, which was uh, uh, analyzed very recently, uh, is data from a, from a cruise, a geotraces cruise uh, led by the French community uh, in the Southern Indian Ocean last year. And I will finalize with some take home messages. All right, so what is nitrogen fixation? Uh, nitrogen fixation, uh, chemically speaking, is just the, the reduction of atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Uh, this is done by some uh, specific microorganisms that I will be talking about in the next slides, uh, which we call diisotropes. 
Uh, this is an entrance of what we call new nitrogen into the into the system that can fuel primary production and uh, all marine food webs. And it's also very important um, in the ability of the ocean to actually capture CO2 and promote export production. So when you put this into um, into numbers, so trying to make the sorry, I'm talking. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so if you if we calculate the the budgets, uh, it turns out that nitrogen fixation is actually uh, providing some 74 percent or so of the fixed nitrogen that is entering the ocean above that that comes with rivers of the atmospheric input. So it, this is actually uh, very important, and this is why we care about it. Um, so where is nitrogen uh, being fixed, actually? So traditionally, we had this view uh, that uh, nitrogen fixation is only important in low-latitude oligotrophic warm seas, such as the uh, oligotrophic uh, subtropical gyres. And this is because in these uh, regions that are uh, chronically stratified, uh, the uh, concentration of nitrogen in the upper layer uh, is, uh, is almost undetectable throughout the year. Uh, so... Uh, nitrogen fixation would come a little bit, say, to the to the rescue to give some nitrogen for the microbial communities there. This is because nitrogen fixation it's it's very energetically expensive, so it costs like something like 16 ATP for the cell, which is quite a lot uh, to fix every molecule of nitrogen. So the moment you have nitrate around, uh, you wouldn't bother to do nitrogen fixation because it's much more energetically expensive. Uh, so this basically brought the community to to center nitrogen fixation studies uh, within the subtropics and tropics uh, and tropical bands. So this is uh, quite updated now, but it will be uh, uh, updated uh, this year in 2022. This is the global database of nitrogen fixation measurements. And you can see quite clearly that most of the measurements have been focused, uh, particularly in the in the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, always with, within uh, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And you uh, might be already very worried about this huge blank here, uh, but don't worry too much. Uh, <laughs> and we have some... Uh, recent evidence that nitrogen fixation uh, does not only occur in uh, subtropical gyres, but also in polar regions such as the Antarctic or the or the Arctic. Also in coastal regions, this is an example from the northeastern American coast, but uh, it has been also been measured in many estuarine areas in, in Scandinavian countries, for instance, or in, uh, in Australia as well. And, and more surprisingly, we have now evidence of uh, nitrogen fixation being active in the dark ocean. So this is a uh, mesopelagic and uh, upper batipelagic data from the uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. So this is kind of, kind of changing pretty much our, our views of nitrogen fixation, what controls it and what limits it and, and to which extent this is actually contributing to uh, nitrogen inputs in the ocean. So when we go to the to our interest here in the in the Indian Ocean, uh, this is something we're working on and compiling the data that has been recently published from the Indian Ocean with regards to nitrogen fixation. But there have been some studies after that 2012 database, uh, some studies in the Arabian Sea, like here, some in the Southern Indian Ocean, and some in the some in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so this is being being compiled to try to. Uh, yeah, find some new partners or understand what's going on with nitrogen fixation in, in this in this region. Uh, all right, so now I will follow to introduce uh, who are these uh, nitrogen fixers. So uh, we call them diosotrophs, and this comes from the Greek where D means two, aso is nitrogen and trophos is nutrition. Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree, so uh, a classification uh, of the of the different diosotrophs and, and basically past the studies traditionally have focused on, on cyanobacteria. But as you'll see, the other three clusters are uh, non-cyanobacterial, such as uh, protobacteria of different of different groups and also methanogens and, and archaea. So uh, I would like to focus my talk on, on this, on these non-cyanobacterial diosotrophs or NCDs that are uh, so uh, unknown to us. Uh, and why are they are known to us? Actually, um, so until the 1990s, pretty much when uh, molecular methods were not available, the, the community relied on microscope to identify um, diosotrophs. So this is why only bigger uh, organisms such as uh, Trichodesmium or, or Richelia could be seen. And, and this provided this view that these uh, organisms are mainly distributed through the tropical and subtropical oceans. 
Um, however, after the 1990s, uh, the, this, this explosion of molecular methods allowed us to analyze the, the uh, a DNA composition of, the, of these communities, and, and we found that there are unicellular diasotropes, uh, such as Cocosphere of UCNA, uh, but also these, uh, these NCDs, these non-cellular bacterial diasotropes, and that they are actually much more widespread and found in different, in different parts of the ocean. Uh, so this is this has been confirmed by looking at databases of the NIFH gene. So NIFH gene is the the gene that encodes for nitrogenase. This is what uh, makes nitrogen fixation possible. And uh, independently of which method we we use uh, to look at the databases, we always come up with a clear dominance of these NCDs in databases. So this, for instance, this is a publication from 2011. Um, by Hannah Fern Lead, where uh, she compiled the data available up to then in, in uh, molecular databases. And, and you see that the blue here represents the gamma proteobacteria, so you can clearly see that they are, uh, these non cellular bacterial diasotropes are actually dominant, whereas cyanobacteria uh, make a much, uh, a much uh, smaller share. Um, in more recent uh, studies, such as the data compilation of the Tower Oceans expedition, um, you come up with pretty much with the same the same conclusion. So what you're using uh, in this case is meta meta genomes in different size fractions. It turns always out that these uh, they call it HBDs here, but specifically we're referring to the same NCDs. Um, they are predominant in the databases. So so we are really curious now to 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 understand what these NCDs are doing, how much nitrogen they are fixing, and uh, how are they distributed as compared to the more uh, traditional diasotropes? But this is, has become um, quite a challenge, and this is because um, these guys are not in culture. So only up, up to today, um, there are only like an, an alpha protobacteria and a, and a gamma protobacteria that have been isolated respectively from the eastern tropical South Pacific oxygen minimum zone and from the Baltic Sea. And those are the only two um, marine pelagic NCDs that have been isolated until until now, and the ones that we can uh, play around with. Uh, also, we have, are facing quite a challenge in the, when we when it turns out to identify them using these molecular methods, and also um, to quantify them because uh, the, these primers that we have been classically using to identify them genetically, actually they do they do not seem to cover the whole diversity. So when you uh, when you use uh, when you try to contrast these NIFH primers against databases, uh, you have like a much uh, lower coverage of the diversity than what you use for instance, for instance metagenome assembled genomes uh, such as the Terra um, Oceans approach. So there's quite a lot to be done. It's not only exploring in, an ex in previously unexplored places, but also to improve our techniques and how we uh, try to detect these organisms. Uh, here's another example of the same thing. So this is a compilation of the ghost ship uh, transects. Uh, this is in, in Presac uh, recently, and they here they compare also the information you get when you do amplification sequencing of marker genes, or uh, sorry, I have a construction up of my head. I'm sorry about that. Um, and when you do uh, metagenomics, and and you'll see that whereas the trends are always uh, more or less the same, uh, the percentage contribution that you get for different uh, groups here. Of the isotropes can be can be widely different, so and some of them completely disappear. So this is quite alarming, and and this is something uh, the community is uh, actually working. Right. So uh, now I'm going to focus on this on this NCD. So uh, if we today we get together like all the uh, NIFH sequences from amplicon sequencing and also from the genomes, we pull them together and we try to do uh, classification and, uh, and clustering. Uh, we come up with a tree like this, which uh, was sent to me by uh, Mo Morando and Kendra Chokobo from, from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and what they, they compile all the sequences here, and you can clearly see that there are two main clusters. So we have this gamma protobacteria and this delta protobacteria. So this is uh, mostly what, the, what, what this NCD community is made of. And, and the gamma protobacteria, again, as we saw previously, they are like uh, present overwhelmingly. So this, so we wanted to focus on these gammas uh, for uh, our studies in the Indian Ocean. If we look further at the diversity of only gammas, 
uh, we have two main groups that come that stand out quite prominently. Uh, one of them is gamma A, and the other one is, is gamma four. So, um, so we want to understand a little bit more what the how these gammas live, and and there are some previous uh, studies from using using cultures. Uh, from from uh, gammas isolated from somewhere from other uh, environments such as soil environments or coastal environments. And one thing we do know is that, for instance, they do not like do not like oxygen. So uh, these are graphs represent uh, uh, acetylene reduction, which is a proxy for uh, nitrogen fixation activity uh, against time. And the moment you inject them with a little oxygen, seven micromolar here or twenty micromolar here, uh, nitrogen fixation activity is quite is is automatically disrupted. So this is uh, something that um, made us think that these uh, NCDs actually predominate in oxygen uh, in oxygen uh, deficient zones such as the Arabian Sea. Um, but however, when you look at the global distribution of these gammas, uh, and, and again, this is not the latest version, this is from a paper in, 20, in 2015, uh, you actually find them pretty much everywhere. This is surface data of uh, presence and expression of NIF-H by these gammas uh, all, over, all over the globe, and, and yet they, they don't seem to be restricted to oxygen uh, deficient zones. So uh, how do they do it? Um, we have this uh, hypothesis that they may uh, live attached to particles um, because particles can generate uh, a gradient in, in oxygen then substituted by other electron donors as you uh, reach the interior of the, of the particle. Um, and this happens uh, when bacteria colonize particles that are uh, rich in organic matter and then start respiring this organic matter and making it more uh, anoxic little by little. So uh, we hypothesize that these uh, particles may be a niche for NCDs to thrive in the in oxygenated environments, uh, not only because of the low oxygen conditions, but also because these uh, particles can provide them with carbon and energy, which can be, uh, of course, very important for NCDs because since they are not photosynthetic, there is no other way for them to obtain um, to obtain carbon from from seawater. And uh, this uh, has been backed up by some studies. So this is a, a previous study in the in the North Atlantic Ocean, for instance, where we uh, quantified these these gammas, which are the, the black dots here, in different size fractions uh, from the from the upper water column. So you can clearly see that when you have it in, in a 10 micron filter, they show up. They also do show up in a, in a three micron filter. But once you go to the free living. Uh, fraction, uh, the point two, uh, they they are just undetectable. So this uh, this uh, is a good hint that uh, these gammas, despite being so small, they if they appear in these larger size fractions, is because they they live attached to something bigger, which could be uh, particles. So based on that, we have been playing around a little bit in the, in the lab where uh, we have been culturing this uh, Bibrio, the Acetrophicus, with, uh, with cell debris. So, um, so we, we generate particles artificially using uh, cultures of the atoms, and then we inoculate them uh, with this Bibrio, the Acetrophicus. And what we find is that uh, the beavers are actually only diastrophically active when they are attached to particles. So uh, what you see here, it's in blue, uh, the, the diatoms and the inactive cells and the pink ones are the ones that are expressing nitrogenase. So uh, you see that anything on the background is actually not shining. So it, it seems that it's only when they are attached to particles uh, where they can find the sufficiently oxygen low conditions and sufficiently carbon rich conditions that will allow them to, to fix nitrogen. Uh, all right, so now going to the to the southern Indian Ocean, uh, say, as you've seen in the previous slide, there's not much data available, but this is what we have compiled so far. In, uh, and the distribution of gamma A, for instance, in the Indian Ocean, there is uh, this uh, data here from Shiosaki et al. In, 20, in 2014. And this is our data recently collected in the southern Indian Ocean in the frame of these string screws uh, that is part of the French Geotraces uh, program. So... Um, the distribution of gamma A's and, and gamma 4's, uh, there were, it was actually quite different. So gamma A seems to be uh, more evenly distributed, uh, although somewhat uh, high, more a little bit more abundant in the southern part of the transect. Uh, whereas for gamma 4, the distribution is quite patchy. So we found like these particular hotspots 
where uh, these gamma force uh, accumulate. So uh, we wanted to know why. So we started um, looking at the distribution of um, the typical parameters you would look at to try to explain the distribution of microbial communities, such as uh, uh, nutrients, in this case uh, nitrate here, and, and phosphate, and we also looked at temperature. And, and although it's quite clear that uh, nutrients are more available in the southern part of the transect where the temperatures are colder, uh, when you do, when you get to do your statistics, uh, this doesn't have any uh, significant relationship with the uh, with the distribution of gammas or uh, gamma A's or gamma fours. So next, we wanted to look at the at the chlorophyll. Uh, this is MODIS data uh, recently recently downloaded, and, and you have the, the gamma A and the gamma four plotted on top. And it seems that uh, the the gammas are pretty much like a like a background carpet, right? So that the the, uh, the abundance does not seem to vary much around all all across the the sampling area. Whereas the gamma force, again, they have these, these peaks, and some of them do coincide with uh, peaks of chlorophyll, but some of them uh, really don't. So it's a, it's quite a quite a mystery. Um, we looked also as well down to the primary production rates. These are primary production rates from the from the crews, uh, same samples where the DNA was extracted from. And and we do see some we do see some patterns where uh, primary production is is higher, uh, coinciding more or less more with this uh, gamma four peaks happen. So uh, next we wanted to do this uh, more statistically, and so here in the in the top panels you have gamma 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 four gamma a and gamma four. Uh, uh, plotted against chlorophyll and against primary production here. And, and yeah, there seems to be a slight uh, positive um, uh, correlation between between these variables, but yeah, the, the numbers are not significant only for uh, gamma-4 against uh, primary production. So this, uh, this again, I think it, it gives us a hint of these gammas being uh, associated to, to particles if these are uh, being related to particles being recently produced uh, by primary production in situ. Um, yeah, so uh, trying to search for other parameters which could explain the distribution. And next, we we looked at uh, the current. So this is a current speed. Uh, you can clearly see the front here. And yeah, at first sight, you don't see any particular any particular patterns. But there is a reason why we are looking for this. Um, and this is because in, in in previous cruises, so this is a, a cruise in the in the South Pacific Ocean, um, we did kind of the same exercise. So here you have uh, absolute dynamic topography, which is similar to SSH or sea sea surface height. And, and current direction and speed in the in the arrows and the distribution of different diastrophs. So these are cyanobacterial diastrophs, trichotesmin and UCNA, and this is uh, gamma A. And when you put it all, put it all together, together with other um, physical parameters such as the Okubo wise parameter or this finite size uh, Leopold exponent parameter, which tells you something about um, horizontal transport barriers or, or home cell frontogenesis. Uh, we clearly see that trichodesmium and, and the gamma A's were uh, impacted by by ADT. So there is uh, something in the in the in the physics in the fine scale physics that is distributing these com these sort of communities uh, differently. So uh, we tested here um, the current velocity against gamma A and gamma four, and you see that the the, the distribution is totally opposite for both. But again, uh, these numbers are not significant. So uh, next, we would like to to have a deeper insight into more these uh, these physical parameters like the SSH and and others uh, taken from altimetry data uh, to 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 try to see if we can uh, decombinate a little bit what is uh, what these gammas are responding to. Uh, right, and this takes me to the uh, to the actual activities. So these are the the nitrogen fixation rate measurements uh, along these uh, string screws. And uh, you see these tons of NDs here, non detected. So uh, pretty much the activity seems to finish uh, once you cross the front here, although uh, not when you get uh, deeper into the uh, into the gyre. Um, so it's uh, still quite a mystery why we have these uh, quite uh, important communities of gammas because these abundances are are pretty high as compared to what has been seen in previous studies. It's uh, maybe half of it. Uh, the max abundance that has been seen before. So we were quite surprised to see these peaks. 
um, but they do not seem to to correspond to an active nitrogen fixation activity. Um, but why could that be? Um, actually, uh, this is a, a, a recent modeling effort uh, about NCD uh, uh, associated to particles, nitrogen fixation, and um, it seems that uh, NCDs are only capable of fixing in a very ephemeral window of time. So if you have a fresh particle uh, with plenty of oxygen, uh, you, will, uh, you will not have nitrogen fixation at the beginning because there is just uh, too much oxygen for nitrogen fixation to occur. But uh, as time passes by and oxygen starts to be uh, consumed, uh, there, there is a, a window in time where oxygen will be sufficiently low, but uh, carbon availability is still sufficiently high to permit nitrogen fixation, which is uh, the, this model curve here. So uh, I think what happens is that uh, when doing integrated measurements, so when, you, when we measure nitrogen fixation, we usually um, take a sample and incubate it for 24 hours with uh, a stable isotopes with 15N. Uh, you are missing actually uh, this short-term variability or this uh, ephemeral window. So something we are uh, planning on doing for future experiments is to um, use an, an underway system that we are that we are developing in collaboration with Sam Wilson from Newcastle University uh, to really uh, look at short-term variability of nitrogen fixation rates. Uh, so this will allow us to have rates every 20 minutes. So uh, hopefully we will get to see. Um, when uh, uh, nitrogen fixation associated to particle changes. Uh, yes, so this takes me to my last slide. This is the, my take home message. So um, and it seems that non-synovectual diasotrophs or NCDs uh, do dominate in higher latitude oceans. Uh, so this is a bit of paradigm uh, change uh, with respect to the predominance of synovectural that we have been uh, always uh, traditionally based on. Um, also, we have seen that the gamma A's and gamma 4's are uh, quite abundant in the southern Indian Ocean and, out, and they seem to occupy uh, different niches. So this is what we are trying to, to tear apart, but uh, we have seen that gamma 4 is, is very patchy, whereas gamma A is more like uh, evenly distributed across the sampling region. Uh, then we have also discussed that nitrogen fixation, their nitrogen fixation potential is still uncertain, but uh, it may provide uh, nitrogen supply whenever uh, nitrogen becomes limited. And finally, uh, our, our next goal would be to, to look at this relationship with organic matter, which needs further study. So with that, uh, I would like to, to acknowledge the, the conference organizers, uh, my, my lab, my students, uh, the, the collaborators of these two projects that we have to work in this uh, nitrogen fixation in the end, the notions who have been seeing, Caroline Lusher and Sophie Bonnet, and all the people from the swing crews that provided uh, all the ancillary data that we had, that I have used today, and, and also the, the, the opportunity to, to get samples from these crews. And, and of course, my students, Yupadip Chuthari, who is the, the, the generator of the data that I have been presented. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mar. That was a great presentation. Fascinating. Of course, I'm probably a little biased having done some work on nitrogen fixation uh, previously in my career, um, but I really enjoyed it. Obvi this is a fascinating topic. Uh, uh, all these new organisms that can fix nitrogen for reasons that obviously we don't fully understand, but boy, does that make it interesting. Um, again, I'm going to go ahead and, and suggest that folks post questions for Mar in the chat box. I'm sure she will answer your questions. I see Greg has been answering questions as well. Thank you, Greg. Um, and uh, go ahead and move on to our last talk. And for that talk by Amal Jayakumar, I'm gonna need Anisha's help uh, to, uh, oh, yeah. the presentation title is Distribution of Nitrogen Fixing Microbes in Oxygen Minimum Zones. So this should be an interesting, uh, uh, continuation of the topic that uh, Mar introduced to us. I do not have audio.
Good afternoon. There we go. Great. I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting for giving me this opportunity to present our work here. Carbon dioxide is fixed and converted to organic matter in the surface ocean by autotrophic processes. This fixed carbon sinks down the water column and is remineralized by heterotrophs, leading to the consumption of dissolved oxygen. Although low dissolved oxygen below the euphotic zone due to mineralization is a widely distributed phenomenon in the world oceans, there are pockets of the ocean where the surface productivity is so high that remineralization switches to anaerobic mode. Such an ocean that which we call OMZs account for about only 1% of the total volume of the ocean, underlying regions of high primary productivity is responsible for the removal of 35% of the marine fixed nitrogen. The three major oxygen minimum zones are shown in red here, Eastern Tropical, North and South Pacific, and the Arabian Sea. Together, these OMZ regions are responsible for the removal of 35% of the nitrogen inventory from the global ocean. Nitrogen fixation is the primary source of fixed nitrogen to the ocean. Nitrogen fixa fixation was traditionally believed to be occur only in the euphotic zone where it is oligotrophic in tropical and subtropical regions of the ocean. However, direct measurements for nitrogen fixation rates was passed as it was not an easy or straightforward measurement. And as the end fixation process itself is patchy, variable in time and space, the direct measurements were very sparse. Hence, models were used generally to infer the fixation rates. These models suggested that maximum fixation rates should occur in the vicinity of OMCs due to the availability of excess phosphorus. Also, the model organisms for the past studies were Trichodesmium and Crocosphera. Direct nitrogen fixation measurements became more reliable with the introduction of 15N techniques. However, that had its own set of problems. With more research, it came to light that cyanobacteria were not the only organisms that could fix nitrogen. There were other prokaryotes that possessed the machinery to fix nitrogen. As nitrogen fixation is an energy energetically expensive process, it was believed that organisms fix nitrogen only in the absence of fixed nitrogen, like nitrate or So the methods used, I'm going to briefly tell you about. So the water was filtered onto Cerevex filters, which is 0.2 micron filters, and stored in liquid nitrogen. And the DNA was extracted in the lab, the DNA and RNA. And PCR methods used by, published by Zaire et al. was used to make to amplify the NIFH gene and clone libraries were made, and I'm going to show you that result. And for NIFH quantification, we use the primers described by Mehta et al. and Dang et al. Those are shorter regions. And for nitrogen fixation rates, we modified the N15 bubble method. So briefly, we inject the bubble into the incubation bottles, gently shake it for about half an hour. And so as the gently, uh, it's gently shaken because it, it is, the community should not be disturbed. So after shaking it for 30 minutes, we replace the gas phase with filtered See site water. So here is the NIFH tree generated from the from the sequence that was 
um, obtained from the three OMZs. NIFH falls generally into four clusters as described by Zayer et al. And here is just the cluster one, which contains the cyanobacteria and the proteobacteria. NIFH phylogeny is congruent with the 16S phylogeny and the cyanos from the alpha, beta, and the gamma proteobacteria. So it's hard for you to see what is in this tree, but um, all the sequences in the in black are the sequences from the database, either from the environment or from cultured sequences, cultured organisms, and the colored ones are from this study. I will zoom into each of these groups and point out the important ones and their association as we go. Of the 534 clones that we analyzed, more than 400 grouped in this cluster one, which contains the cyanobacteria and the proteobacteria, as I said. Just follow the color code. Um, in blue is, are the sequences from the ETSP OMZ, in red, the ETNP, and in magenta, the Arabian C. Most, sorry, the majority of the sequences fall in cluster are within the, cluster one are within the alpha and the gamma proteobacteria. Here I am zooming in into the gamma section. There are 95 sequences clustered in this group. On top here, we have Vibrio diosotrophicus, which are usually associated with cyanos in other environments. But here in the um, Arabian Sea, we found um, Vibrios right in the middle of the oxygen minimum zone at um, 175 meters and also at the oxycline, 110 meters. Below that, we have the Esotobacter Vinelandiae here, which is a lab rat for nitrogen fixation studies. And it is important organism in the terrestrial environment. We found sequences close to Vinelandiae in the Arabian Sea and ETSP, but none from the ETNP. At the bottom here, we have the zooplankton associated purpuratum, but none of our sequences were closely related to this group here. So here we have the, uh, the second cluster, that is the cluster two, three, four of NIFH sequences. So the cluster three and four represent sequences from extreme environments and many sequences from our study is represented here, but no close identities to any cultured organisms. As you can see here, uh, that we have sequences from the Arabian Sea, ETNP, and ATSP. Um, but, uh, and the cluster four represents archaea, spirochetes, sulfate reducers, and clostridia. But uh, again, none closely related to cultured species, but there was one sequence um, in the uh, ETNP that was 100% identical to a sequence that was uh, derived from the Mediterranean Sea. Hence, to synthesize this data, we combined all the sequences and based on 3% difference in sequences um, divergence, we uh, converted these sequences into OTUs, and uh, all the sequences uh, fell into more than uh, 30 OTUs. But here I'm showing you only the top 12 OTUs. Most of the OTUs were singletons. Uh, on the left is cluster one, and on the right is cluster three and four. So what it basically tells is that in between Arabian Sea, ETNP, and ETSP, there was no real overlap between the sequences. 
So the the top OTU, there was uh, overlap between the Arabian Sea and the ETNP, but there was none from the ETSP. So there were no one OTU that was common to all the three OMZs. Similarly, when you look at the OMZ versus surface in the second, um, again, it was only the top OTU that was common to both the surface and the OMZ depth. All the others were separated out either in the surface or in the um, OMZ depths. Here we have the distribution of nitrogen fixation rates um, from the ETNP on the right. So in red are the significant rates that's above detection limit. So on your y-axis is the depth and on the x-axis, it is the uh, rate of nitrogen fixation in nanomole per day. And on the left in blue are the distribution of the NIF H copy numbers. So you can clearly see that there's a relationship between the copy numbers of NIF H and the nitrogen fixation rates. Mostly where the rates are high, you do find high copy number of NIF H. And we did this for two different stations and the pattern is the same. And here, just to show you that this difference between nitrogen fixation rates between the coastal stations and the open ocean stations, I've plotted all the rate from the coastal stations here on left and um, all the open ocean stations on the right. Clearly, um, the coastal stations have higher nitrogen fixation rate than the open ocean stations. So to summarize, the NIFH distribution and rate measurements show that nitrogen fixation capability is present in all the three ODZs, oxygen minimum zones. Uh, the diverse clades of microbes with NIFH gene present and active in the ODCs, but gamma and alpha proteobacteria are the most, most important groups of um, nitrogen fixers within the oxygen minimum zones. Um, tri uh, trichodesmium you do find in the surface, but um, it was in our studies, we didn't find uh, too many trichodesmium uh, or um, other cyanobacteria bacterial sequences um, over the oxygen minimum zones. And cluster four sequences are also present. Cluster two were never present in any of the three oxygen minimum zones. There was detectable rates of nitrogen fixation within the ODAC depths. Um, and the highest rates were in the surface. And there were detectable rates within the OMC, but very, very low. So near the shore, the nitrogen fixation rates were much higher than the open ocean stations. Nitrogen fixation rates in the ODs, ODZs are low, uh, but when you compare it to end removal, it's very, very low. It does not offset the end removal. The nitrogen fixation does not offset the end removal. So NIFH abundance reflects the nitrogen fixation rates. So with this, I would like to thank with this, I would like to thank the Ward Lab members who participated with me on this cruise and helped me process the data and um, do some of the work. And Bonnie Chang of our collaborators and the Maloland Lab, uh, who were our collaborators in all this work. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Anish, uh, for playing that for us. And if you're out there somewhere, Amal, thank you for that uh, excellent uh, presentation um, on nitrogen fixation in the OMZs, uh, very much uh, complementary to uh, Mar's uh, previous presentation. So let's get all of our uh, panelists to turn their cameras on. There's, there's Sunil and Mar, and uh, we only have three folks here, but that's good enough, um, and Greg. And, and what I'd like to do is, you know, I have to admit that, you know, we've gone from a lot of 
really basic science here. I mean, the talks that we just heard are all really about fundamental scientific investigation. And we've been tasked to leap uh, to a much more general topic, uh, the questions, uh, how do we understand the sources of pollutants and their potential impacts on human health and ocean ecosystems? Uh, what are the best possible solutions to monitor, protect, manage, and restore ocean ecosystems and their biodiversity? Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how to handle that big of a leap. Um, uh, and although I guess we'll just, I mean, obviously there's some, some of the most obvious linkages are perhaps to uh, Sunil's work, especially things like lead pollution that are showing up in Geotrace's data. Um, also perhaps, perhaps some linkages to topics related to Greg's work on, on sediment biogeochemistry, because humans obviously have a hu huge app impact on coastal, coastal sediment biogeochemistry. Um, uh, the nitrogen cycle is important to humans in the broadest sense, uh, and nitrogen fixation, uh, because if we don't have nitrogen fixation, uh, we got a problem in the oceans. Um, but let's just go around the, yeah, we've got 14 minutes for this, for this discussion. Let's just go around the room here in the order that we presented, and I'll ask you each to, you know, take a couple of minutes, a few minutes to respond to those questions. And, and if your response is, I don't know what to say, that's fine, <laughs> um, because this is, this is a big leap. Um, and, and, it, and although it's a leap that we have to deal with, because the UN decade questions are all like this. They're all very broad societal relevant questions. So let's, let's, uh, it's, this is perhaps the easiest for Sunil, but maybe let's, let's start with Sunil and see if Sunil, why don't you take a crack at comments and responses to those questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so the first question, when you were talking about the sources of pollution, I think uh, IJ have, was showing uh, some result of lead. So particularly the coastal areas are uh, very prone to this type of pollution. Uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that open ocean is not, but the more prominent is the coastal areas. And uh, some of the work which we have carried out in the coastal areas they show that uh, like lead or even iron has polluted by order of three order of magnitude higher some of the areas in the coastal region. Lead is similarly very high, copper is very high, cadmium is very high. And if you particularly talk about the coastal Indian Ocean, the eastern part is much more polluted compared to the western part. So if you want to track the sources, of course, hotspot can be identified using the elemental analysis. But I think uh, if you do try to do the isotopes of these elements, I think that will be much easier to track the sources. So whether it is iron, so iron and lead, I think what we are thinking or what we have observed that wherever the coal jetties are there or coal uh, it is getting utilized in the, um, uh, for electricity production, these, these elements are getting uh, supplied to the coastal areas very significantly. Wherever coal jetties are there, I think uh, in those areas, uh, or whether we have coal thermal pl power plants, I think uh, iron is getting uh, contaminated through the groundwater or HGDs, and it is coming to the coastal water, and it is becoming very, very high. So similarly, I think many of the elements are getting increased, and I think one way to track that is to do the isotopic analysis of the lead or iron or, or other elements to track those sources. Similarly, how they are going to the food, food cycle and how it will influence the human being, I think they are also a uh, food cycle if you try to track this uh, through isotopes, I think we can easily track the sources from the source to the sea. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And, and absolutely, there, I mean, there's no question in my mind that, that, the, that the geotraces data are so are actually so are quite relevant to these questions, especially understanding sources of pollutants. Uh, again, the, the yeah, the lead and the iron uh, stories and some of the other metals are clearly uh, related to anthropogenic sources. And so those data give us a direct clues as to where 
uh, some of those uh, pollutants are coming from. Uh, let me hand it over to you, Greg. Do you have any thoughts to add from your perspective, from the sort of sediment biogeochemistry perspective? I, I wouldn't say it was specifically about sediment biogeochemistry. It's more about, um, uh, I've been thinking about the Indian Ocean and how it's changing for a long time. And, 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 and I think it's with respect to hypoxia, for instance, that I think is it, which, and its relationship to eutrophication, whereby um, there are, um, that can be considered a pollution issue, especially if hypoxia gets to the extent where you have major regions of, of dead zones, for instance, that have huge societal um, implications. So man, anthropogenic impacts on, on, through hypoxia um, is not just... Sorry, I had Sorry. Well, we've got some interference, uh, please, folks. We've got some new. Um, I see uh, Yudisha. I think that's what we're getting stray audio from Yudisha. Please mute. Thank you. Okay. Um. So. Um. In relation to that, I think. I mean, having with my cyber hat and my imber hat on i mean over the last three decades i mean there's the indian ocean in terms of big issues has i mean like sight singer has has targeted change changes in land use on the subcontinent as and nitrogen inputs to the ocean as potential drivers for um for increasing height eutrophication and hypoxia um, and with the Bay of Bengal sitting poised to flip into full you know, hypoxia and deoxygenation, I think one, one thing that we could be doing is really trying to target those big issues that could be um, changing. And, and along with, so in relation to those, I would say um, things like changes in land use in terms of aeolian inputs but also for instance um in relation to riverine inputs and the fact that there are huge projects out there to change the ganga brahmaputra um, inputs to the bay of bengal have huge implications in terms of hypoxia dead zones and therefore human um populations um and so i think that kind of analysis of the Indian Ocean and region by region is really worth pursuing, especially in these critical areas like the Bay of Bengal. Um, and just trying to figure out what, what we ought to be doing is trying to figure out how these large anthropogenic changes, what the, 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 how sensitive the, the Bay of Bengal will be to those. And another thing comes from a personal observation and, and one that may be very um, much a, 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 a big question or an understudied question in the Indian Ocean is plastics. Um, and, and this comes from my personal observation at, at being at a, in a submersible at a thousand meters depth and looking out a porthole that was about 10 centimeters across and about 200 kilometers offshore at a thousand meters depth seeing a sort of a, 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 a five meter by five meter plastic tarpaulin float by um, uh, uh, on the seafloor. Um, so um, I think that Indian Ocean is um, a, a huge plastic problem um, and it's very unclear what the fate of plastics in, this, in the Indian Ocean is relative to other ocean regions. So that would be my two bits of things would be to summarize plastics, but also just um, what are the big changes happening across the Indian Ocean region in terms of both aeolian and riverine inputs and their downstream impacts on hypoxia and well eutrophication, hypoxia, and then um, um, resources for humans. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I would reiterate your point that we and we've argued this in many science plans and proposals that that the Indian Ocean is in many ways. It has many canaries in many coal mines uh, that are will be harbingers or indicators of how uh, the oceans are. We'll see those effects of pollutants and, and anthropogenic impacts likely first in the Indian Ocean, not only from the pollution sources, the sensitivity of the OMZs, but also the very rapid warming that we're seeing in the Indian Ocean. So, so it, it, the Indian Ocean, the humans are turning it into a real test case of 
what's going to happen due to our influences and the Indian Ocean is likely going to respond first. Um, so I think those are very good points. Thank you for those comments. So Mar, do, did you have any thoughts to add uh, to this, to what we just discussed or the questions in general? Yeah, I wanted to add something about the, the plastics because I, I was uh, looking at the program and searching yeah, just for plastics as a key keyword. And I see that uh, there are some 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 five uh, studies that have been presented uh, during the conference, but it's mostly about the microplastics. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but I see that um, nanoplastics and dissolve and things that you will measure in the dissolved fraction are, are uh, an eventual pro problem that is uh, more difficult to detect, but it's... Uh, more affecting the, the microbial communities that are at the base of the trophic webs. So, so yeah, I would wonder what the, the community, if anybody working in the Indian Ocean is actually looking at uh, the dissolved fraction or also uh, organic contaminants that are absorbed into nanoplastics and, and so forth, because this is uh, definitely something that is uh, even, even more tragic than uh, larger particles. Yeah. Well, the microplastic problem uh, yet is, is being very rapidly revealed as a huge problem. We see these big pieces go away, but they don't go away. They just get small. Um, and and so and I, I'm not aware, I don't know anybody personally who's, I know some folks that work on plastics in the ocean, but not in the Indian Ocean in particular. Um, uh, I'd be curious, uh, maybe I could reach out to the audience. Is there anybody in the audience who, uh, is working uh, on plastics that would like to speak up and respond to uh, Mars comments. Hi, Rale. So this is yeah, this is Arvin. If I can say something. Yeah, hi, Ar hi, Arvin. Yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So regarding the mi microplastic in the IIOU2 synthesis papers, we have a paper on microplastics uh, written by Chari. So there are a, uh, there is a big group uh, who is working in the Indian Ocean. And then in PRL, uh, there is a scientist who started working on the microplastic even in the atmosphere, so the ocean atmosphere. So that would also be quite quite challenging and something useful, and which is, I think, proposed by Peter Lees uh, some time back, that there is microplastic in the atmosphere. But not not only in the Indian Ocean, we don't have the data even from the other oceans in the that how much is the microplastic in the atmosphere. Yeah, well, thank you, Ar Arvind. You just revealed that I had a senior moment in my previous comments. Uh, of course, I'm aware of Chari's work. I was the editor of the of the special issue. My bad. That <laughs> had a little brain uh, flake out there. Uh, it, for those who are interested, Chari Patriarchi, I'm probably saying his name wrong. Maybe Arvind, can you throw, put his name in the in the chat so folks can can see his his name? It's a it's a rel he's Sri Lankan. His last name's hard to write and pronounce. Um, yes, indeed, he has. Uh, that is the one person I know that works on plastics, and I forgot that I knew him. But anyway, thank you for that comment, Arvind. Uh, yeah, sorry, really, I have one more apology. I can't see my chat, so I tried to log out three times, log in three times, but somehow I don't see the chat. It's it's gone. It was there in the morning. It's gone. So I can't do that. But do you pronounce it correctly? I, I yeah. think people will find it. Yeah. yeah. If anybody can can throw uh, uh, Chari's name into the chat, please do, um, for folks who don't know him or of his work. Well, thank you for that comment. It looks like we're out of time. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time to discuss, but this seems like it's the way things always go. Um, and it would have been really fun to spend more time talking about uh, some of the really fascinating results that were presented in, in our four talks today. Uh, I thought all four talks were extremely interesting. Um, uh, and, uh, and all of those topics are things that, that I'm quite interested in, and I'm sure uh, many people in the audience are also interested. So I would encourage folks in the audience uh, to, you know, you know uh, our, our speakers here, uh, Sunil, uh, Sunil Singh and uh, Mar and Greg and, and Amal, uh, please feel free. I hope I can speak for you guys. Please feel free to reach out to them if you want to chat with them over email about their work, get some reprints um, of what they're up to. Uh, please do that. I'm sure they will be quite receptive. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and, and close the session. Thank our speakers. Thank our organizers uh, for putting this together. And uh, we'll see many of you tomorrow in our continuing sessions.
Yeah. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Relewood and all thank the you. Uh, panelists for taking your valuable time. I know for some of you, it's been a long day. Uh, started chairing the session and also you have a lot of work tomorrow. Uh, but for all the people who are connected and all the audience, uh, just to remind you, like, don't miss the panel discussion on 18th, where the whatever we discussed today here will be presented uh, on the panel discussion on the contribution to the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.